my name is Daniel Skarinkin, as uh, Thorsten already said, and greetings from the University of Potsdam, uh, where I uh, work as the coordinator for Digital Humanities Network, as a Netzwerk Digitale Geisteswissenschaften. And I want to thank uh, Humboldt Universität uh, Berlin uh, for this opportunity, and of course, thank you all for taking time to listen to this talk. I'll try to make it interesting for you, and I will be, of course, happy to answer all your questions as good as I can. Now, before we begin, uh, I want to start uh, with a couple of disclaimers. First, as Thorsten already let you know, I'm not a historian, uh, which I also mentioned to the organizers of this talk right after I was invited. <laughs> uh, yeah, as Thorsten said, my education was in the field of natural language processing. Uh, I did my PhD in computational literary studies, and that's what I do on a daily basis, basically, here in Potsdam and before that. I mostly program for philology and for philologists. Uh, so, but uh, luckily research these days is rarely done alone, and I'm happy to say that uh, this research, which I'm going to talk about today, has been uh, inspired and co coordinated by a number of real historians, uh, namely, um, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, namely, um, Irina Mahalova, whom, um, whose uh, name you see on the on the slide uh, and um, Artem Krukov and some others so uh, she, she's a, it, it is a specialist in the 20th century Russia and especially in the wartime Soviet col collaborators with the uh, with the Nazi army and uh, a number of history master students so this is a research where we combined our joined our forces and I'm just a talking hand uh, talking head basically in this research and uh, it was a collaborative effort. And second thing I must say is that, again, as Thorsten already said, uh, most of my research career was in the, not in Potsdam, but in Moscow, where I was part of the Digital Humanities Center of Higher School of Economics. But uh, this spring, after Russian invasion of Ukraine, and uh, basically after our um, uh, after our failed attempts to protest against it, uh, I left Russia in somewhere between March and April, and now I well, now I thank the German academic community for <laughs> being so welcoming because I immediately found a place here at the University of Potsdam and now I continue my academic life right here uh, in Germany. And now that we're done with the disclaimers and some personal details, we can actually go on with the talk. And now I'm going to outline my talk, so uh, let's get to the point. Uh, what um, What is this uh, talk going to be about? Um, so first I'll talk about the idea of the project, uh, uh, and which is essentially looking for overlaps, uh, looking for matching people in different people-focused historical databases relevant for 20th century Russia, and I will later explain which databases we use and why it makes sense to try to link them. Second, uh, Second, I will explain some rather simple record linkage strategies which we used, which nonetheless already provide some interesting matches which we study further in depth. And finally, I'll talk about a showcase study which I titled The Condemned Heroes, or Which of These Databases is Lying? Um, it has to do with the intersection of one huge World War II participants database curated by the Russian Minister of Defense, by the way, <laughs> and the smaller research database of Soviet citizens who were accused of collaboration with the, with the German army, with Wehrmacht, uh, in the time of Second World War. Um, this is kind of a chair on top of my talk, uh, so I left it for the end, uh, because it's the most entertaining part, and uh, yeah, to spark your interest a bit, I'll say that uh, it actually involves some people who were proclaimed dead in early, in early 40s uh, of the 20th century, but then resurfaced alive in the late 80s. And this happens within a database family of a single project, basically. So there is a project which has several records on single person, and some of them claim that he is dead already in 1944, and at the same time, uh, some other uh, records claim that he was alive in 1989. So I hope this serves as a teaser to you, to at least wait for the third part to start and not leave earlier. Uh, and now let's begin with the first part, with the idea. 
so the idea, mm, the yeah, the idea for this uh, research originates from the fact that the largest big people human centered databases in Russia uh, in the 20th century Russia are focused on the events which happened quite near to each other on a temporal scale basically um, and even overlapped as in the case of uh, for instance World War II and Stalin era repressions so repressions took place before the war but also during the war and even after the war for until basically Stalin's death uh, yeah, maybe it's because Russian history basically goes from one mass homicide to another. I don't know what's wrong with us, but anyway, um, and uh, to a lesser extent also World War One. But all the, all these three events, which involved heavy bureaucracy and involved millions of people, they are all in the time span of like forty years. So obviously, you can imagine people who would take part in both or even in all three of them. Uh, so obviously, these databases, if they contain um, for instance, millions of participants of the Second World War from the Soviet side, and if they also contain millions of records about repressed individuals in the Stalin era, obviously there will be same people, obviously there will be overlaps, right? Uh, so our idea was basically there are these overlaps, obviously we can even, it's not so hard to find some particular examples of such overlaps, but at the same time, these databases have absolutely no record linkage between them. They are kind of mutually agnostic. So these are different databases. There is no way for, for instance, to get uh, with a single query. You can't get really uh, people who are who are um, who, who are in both databases. And so we thought that it's good to start some trying to to link them. So it's good to try to identify these overlaps because obviously these people will have same names, surnames, uh, maybe geographical data, birth dates, and that kind of stuff. So maybe it's possible to link them to filter out the false links where people are just uh, each other's namesakes. It happens a lot with frequent names like Ivan Ivanov or something like that. And maybe provide even some record linkage on top. So let me give you one uh, example. Uh, and at the same time, this example will help me to uh, actually introduce the databases that we are talking about. So here you can see one of more than 3 million entries in the Repression Victims Database maintained by Memorial, which is one of this year's Nobel, Prize Prize winner, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners. And by the way, if you try to access the website, which is here on these slides, you won't be able to do it today because after all these police raids, which were um, targeted at this organization, which is banned in Russia, as you might have heard, um, they are still trying to recreate their digital infrastructure. The bases are, of course, intact, but at the moment, you can only reach this data through Internet Archive. Uh, but anyway, so you can see that um, it features a certain Soviet citizen, he's nothing special, no, not a celebrity, just an ordinary man, um, convicted in summer 1945, right after the start of, start, stop of the war, for treason, Article 58 of the Penal Code, very typical accusation, uh, treason of the state, literally, uh, 10 years in Gulag, quite a typical story for that time. And you can see some data fields which are which describe this person. Uh, but let's move on and look at another database and uh, at somebody who looks uh, suspiciously similar to this person. Uh, this is a database um, uh, commemorating Soviet losses in World War II. This is actually his loss report. Um, usually these loss reports say that the person was killed, wounded, or went missing, or went in, into captivity if he was, for instance, captured by the opposing side. But here it actually says in the field reason for loss, it says convicted here. Um, it says asurjdan, which literally means convicted. So obviously, uh, and if you look at the place of birth, we can see that it's actually the same village. Uh, I mean, it's maybe not so obvious for those of you who can't read Russian, but I can assure you that it's the same village. Uh, but we'll talk about the hardships of uh, geography matching later. Uh, so, but let's move on. Uh, we can then go on to yet another database, which is uh, related to the previous one. Uh, it's done by the same organization, but it focuses on the awards, on the military awards received by Soviet citizens after the Second World War. Um, and it's actually, there's actually much more glorification in it. You can see from the design, it's kind of, it's called Podvik Naroda, which can be translated as the great deed of the people, so to speak. Um, and so now, you know, from this uh, list on the same person, 
because same village, same um, all, all, all the parts of the names are same, including patronym and the birth birth date. So this couldn't really be a coincidence. And from this, we know that he actually survived until at least 1989 because he was awarded by this uh, jubilee. Uh, award for the um, Order of Great Patriotic War, um, which uh, was at the moment mass awarded. Basically, the Soviet uh, the Soviet uh, authorities in the late 80s they started this um, increasing this uh, glorification of the war, and after the 40th anniversary of the victory, millions of like five millions of people were awarded. Basically, everybody who survived uh, by this time to to just to add anecdotal evidence to the statistical one, I can say that both. Both my grandfather's fathers and the grandmother received such an award. So <laughs> obviously, it's um, yeah, it's it's something that everybody who survived until that point and who was listed as the war participant received um, um, basically received this. Yeah, and we can then go on and look at the yet another database, the final the final one, uh, which is uh, called the Memory of the People, and it's uh, more or less an enriched merge of the previous two databases of the Podvik Narod and the Obede. Um, and here again we have, and you can see again from the design that it's not a very neutral database. It's kind of politically politically skewed towards glorification, obviously. And you can see here the same person, Nikolai Nikolaevich Luzanin, uh, as this kind of glorified war participants again. His awards are actually mentioned, his order, which he received much later, but it's not mentioned here. Um, and his time in Gulag, of course, is not mentioned here. Uh, so you can see that obviously there is, an, there is a kind of a... Sorry, uh, there is no linkage whatsoever between the repressed uh, Nikolai Nikolaevich Luzanin and the war hero Nikolai Nikolaevich Luzanin. The databases are, again, as I said, mutually agnostic. And also there is an obvious ideological antagonism between the databases because, well, you can guess that this World War II databases, which are ordered uh, and curated by the Ministry of Defense of Russia, it's obviously targeted at this glorification of the victory of Soviet Union in the Second World War. And uh, if you read their self-positioning on the index web page, you can see that uh, the database is, it's the database of the defenders of the motherland with a big M capitalized, uh, who died, uh, were wounded or reported missing in action during the Great Patriotic War and in the post-war times. So it's my translation, but I preserve the original capitalization. And capitalization is not, uh, in Russian, is not very common. Um, and uh, in this self-description, they actually don't talk about a large chunk of this database who are not uh, killed or wounded or reported missing, but who are actually uh, listed as deserted or convicted um, or uh, convicted to some to, or executed even. Uh, and there is many of them. Uh, I tried counting and uh, I looked for uh, only for those records in this loss reports, which which say deserted. Like the, the, the soldier has deserted its rank and that's why he is being listed in the loss reports. And there is more than 64,000 of such soldiers in, in these databases. But they, of course, do not try not to notice this. And also, uh, what's more interesting, and this, this is where we first uh, get closer to this, um, to this thing about, um, um, to this thing about uh, our third part of the story, which of the databases is lying. Not all people who are listed as killed or deceased, uh, not all of them were actually killed or deceased or died during the war. For instance, uh, here you can see a record for the from this loss report. It says uh, information from the report of the uh, of the loss. And this person, Philemon Gavreluk, he is listed as killed, so I translated it for you. Uh, and there is even a very specific location of the grave here. It says like 500 meters from the forest edge in the village named like this, uh, somewhere in uh, the modern day Latvia, apparently. Uh, and uh, how do we know? Um, uh, how do we know that he was not killed? Well, I'll tell you in the third part of my talk, but of course, uh, so let this remain as um, a suspense once more. But of course, uh, you may have guessed already that uh, we link this record to another one in another database. And this another database tells us that actually this person was not uh, killed. And here's another, here's another example for you. Uh, this person, Iwasifalevich Lebit, uh, he is listed as 
just dead or died, not even killed, but just just dead. Uh, and he also has a very specific location of his grave here uh, in Czechoslovakia, in uh, like Czech Republic or Slovakia. I don't know which uh, part of it is actually now, but anyway, uh, it's some village called Kanora, uh, near next to the church, uh, tomb number five. So it's like very, very precise. It seems like, I mean, he should be there in there in this tomb, but he's not. Um, he is not there. Um, and how do we, we can actually this in this case we can actually know that he was alive after the war, uh, even from the same family of databases. Because if we go back and look at this uh, Podvik Naroda database, which is focused on awards, as I said before, uh, we can find the same person, and it's quite a rare combination of names and also um, uh, the birth year. And uh, the main thing is the geography. So it's like uh, a specific small city in the Rivno. Uh, the Rivno region of Ukraine, so it's it can't be a coincidence. And this person was again awarded with this jubilee award of Order of the Great Patriotic War in 1986, when everybody who was still alive was awarded. So we know. <laughs> um, and I'm going to reveal more about the fates of these two persons uh, in the final part of my talk. Uh, so uh, I hope this is going. To, I hope this again serves as a kind of a teaser for now. But first, let's talk a bit about how, in general, we tried linking the databases and what were our le record linkage attempts. Uh, so the databases are really huge. Uh, as I said, this uh, repressed database has more than three million uh, records, and the other database, the uh, World War II database, it has several lists, and each of them is like tens of millions. So, for instance, this loss reports, which is just one kind of documents, uh, there's more than 11 million of them. Of course, this does not really translate into people, um, so there are that one person can have more than one records. For instance, first the person goes to a hospital and it's recorded as a loss, and then the person dies and it's recorded as another loss. So it's not equal. It doesn't equate to 11 million people lost, but still it's um, it's still millions of people. So it's really hard in this case to apply some more sophisticated scenarios, and you have to start with the very basic ones. So what we did first is basically we applied some very primitive uh, record linkage between these two databases, the Memorial Repress database and the World War II losses databases database. Basically, we tried to do the match on forename, like the first name, like Daniil, the patronym, which is a very typical thing in Russia. So in every document you have a patronym, like your father's name in a special form, like for me it would be Andreevich, and surname, for me, it would be Skarinkin. Uh, so this three give you some match, but it's not enough, of course, because there will be hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of Ivan Ivanovich Ivanov or Ivan Petrovich Petrov or uh, like, I don't know, like Hans Müller. <laughs> uh, how many Hans Müllers are there in Germany? Uh, so you can also add to this year of birth because you don't always have the exact date of birth. So most of the time you have only year of birth. So that's what we did. And so we tried matching on this four. So what will we get if we match on forename, patronym, surname, and year of birth? Exact match on all four without, like, at this point, we didn't take into account any um, editorial distances of other ways of fuzzy matching between strings which are similar but not the same. We just did very exact match. So what happened? Uh, we got an intersection which uh, was almost 100,000 items, uh, so 96 point something matched entries by surname plus name plus password name plus year of birth. Um, of them, uh, we tried to focus on the ones which are unique, which means that there are only one, there's only one person on each side which has this particular combination. Because I mean, if it's not unique, if even in one base, you already have like five people which are named like Ivan Ivanovich Ivanov, born in 1922, and in another base you have like seven of them. Sometimes it's just impossible without going into something, some other resources, without trying to go deep into the archives to 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 identify who of these are actually the same person. So we tried to identify to to focus on the unique matches, but still there were too many of them. Like 51,000 is a lot to investigate. So obviously we have lots of false positive results here, which are just uh, people who happen to have the same name and same birth year. Uh, so obviously this this requires additional filtering. 
and the thing we have for um, the thing we the data we have which allows us to for additional filtering is of course geographical data now it's a bit harder to work on geogra to work on geography um it's a bit harder to work on geography uh now if we go back to our uh to uh, to the person you already know to the to this uh, Lusanian person who who is present in both the databases and who is uh, who is one of these people we want to match you can see that he has this um date of uh, in both databases he has this place of birth and also in uh, his, uh, he also has a uh, place of uh, conscription in one of the databases and it, you can see that it's uh, kind of the same village uh, it's but it's spelled very differently and it's kind of the same region but even in the region there is a um, discrepancy so basically what we tried to do is we tried to extract this uh, first of all the region like the gebiet uh, in german you would say i guess uh, so we tried to extract this but even uh, so so, so uh, sometimes it's easier because the address is kind of structured you see the you have the region the 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 district inside the region and then you have the village but even here you already see what kind of challenges we encounter for instance uh, this uh, person Luzanin, whom i showed you in the beginning uh, in the world time database he is listed as the person from novosibirsk oblast like novosibirsk kibit basically uh, and in the uh, repressed database, he is listed as the person from Tomsk Oblast, so Tomsk region, Tomsk Kibit. Why? Well, because Novosibirsk is a new city, and at some point it emerged in like in the 20th century, and at some point it beca became this big new Soviet industrial and academic center in the Sib Siberia, and it acquired its own region. And so it shows you how this fluidity in regional division. So Tomsk Oblast became smaller, <laughs> and now the village changed its uh, territorial affinity basically, and. And, uh, but this this is one of the problems that you encounter when you try to record link databases because well it doesn't match right you you can't really match Novosibirsk to Tomsk here unless you know a great deal about how the Soviet territorial division was um, was in the begin in the middle of the 20th century and at this point you might say well okay but he has the same village so why don't you just match the village and i will say uh -uh, it's still not still not uh, still not successful because uh, here as you can see the village is spelled one way um uh like on the left it's spelled uh Apsagachewa, and on the right it's spelled Apsagachewa. Because most of these databases were filled out uh, basically from the hearing, so phonetically. So somebody in the uh, conscription office in the 1940s was uh, writing it as the conscript conscripts were saying it. So uh, we also have many more variants like Absagach, <laughs> Absagach. So there's, I think, five of them. Uh, so you can see how, how, how challenging it is to structure and uh, normalize and match geography. But anyway, we tried. And we tried to, but as of now, we only tried very exact match on the on the oblast, on the region. Uh, and as you see, there we we inevitably we ran into having into losing a lot of real matches. So we basically, when we added this, when we added this fifth match, um, we basically traded off uh, our. Uh, recall for precision uh, if you use the information retrieval terms so basically we had very ma too many matches and now we have too few uh, here we only at the moment have 159 matched entries which match exactly by surname name patronym year of birth they are unique matches from both sides and they have the same region of birth so here we have lots of mismatches uh, as you remember we had like almost more than 50,000 uh, and now we have uh, now we have only 159 so basically we replaced a lot of uh, false positive with, with a lot of false negative with a lot of uh, cases where we didn't find the match where there should have been a match but uh, this number is actually more comforting because you can start looking into these people with your own eyes because this is the point where you can stop trying to do this big data analysis or relatively big data analysis and switch to again to the from this distant view to the closer view and zoom in into individual in, in into individual uh, um, lives and tra trajectories so uh, we looked at these cases not all of them but uh, like dozens of uh, cases which we managed to retrieve this way 
And uh, most of them are quite typical and uh, it's not very informative from these two databases, so we can't really tell a lot. So most of them are like a um, person who is listed as um, convicted in the wartime database here on the right side of the slide. Uh, so he was convicted for uh, in in some some time at some point in 1945, and here and on the left we have the data from the repression data database, which says that he was convicted by the military tribunal of this particular rifles division, and uh, he was convicted of the um, again of the 58th uh, article of the Soviet Penal Code, which is very typical. It's it's uh, propaganda or agitation, which is anti-Soviet. I mean, that's the typical. Uh, Typical, uh, typical article they used. Probably he wrote something which he shouldn't have written in his uh, letter or whatnot. Like Solzhenitsyn was the famous Russian uh, literature Nobel Prize laureate, the author of Gulag Archipelago. He was he he did the same. His his um, fate was basically the same. He was in the army and then he wrote something which uh, the censors considered as the treason in the in one of his private letter and and he was taken from the uh, from the front and uh, convicted. So such stories are very typical. Uh, so first war, first person person is serving in the army, and then the person is being um, convicted. So nothing really interesting. Uh, this is uh, this case is a bit more interesting. Um, so in this case, we have uh, some person who is uh, uh, who served as the. Uh, uh, as the deputy chief of the financial uh, department of a certain avia ar aerial regiment, so seems to be pretty high in the army hierarchy and not a not a not a not 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 a private but an officer, and he was arrested. Uh, so first we know uh, for the first re the earlier record is the repression record, which says that he was arrested in 1942 uh, and was convicted by the again by the military court. And was convicted again by the same same article of the Soviet Penal Code, so treason, and convicted to ten years of uh, ten years of prison. But apparently, he did not serve in prison. Apparently, he went back to the front in the in one of these uh, penal military units, like Straf Einheit, I think you would say in German. So again, there's a lot of resemblance to what we are seeing today in the news, uh, I think. But uh, anyway. Uh, so, and in 1943, so a year after he was convicted, we see that he was killed, uh, killed uh, in the in this uh, uh, here they list the last place of his service, and it's uh, in Volkhov Front, the first uh, panel battalion, basically the first panel battalion. So he was serving in the infantry in this uh, Straf Einheit, and of course it's it was a very tough place to serve, and he died there. So uh, these are the kind of uh, these are the kind of biographies that you can find and retrieve from the from the from the, this intersection, and we can we continue to work on it. Uh, and I will um, in the last slide I will tell you tell something what we intend to do with this part of our this this direction of our research. Uh, but at this point, I invite you to uh, actually the third and the juiciest part of my talk, where we tried the same record linkage uh, approaches which I showed you on these two big databases on a smaller database mm, on a smaller database and it's a the database which was compiled by my colleagues uh, Irina Mahalova and Seth Bernstein who is a by the way a great uh, a very remarkable uh, digital historian as well and so if you haven't had him before in this colloquium I advise you to have him at some point and to invite him uh, so they compiled this database of people convicted for collaboration with the, the enemy so with the with the Wehrmacht uh, during and after World War II and it's a very small database it has only about a thousand records uh, a bit less mm. And its sources are criminal case records from the archives of um, uh, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, uh, from the archives of the Holocaust Memorial in the United States, and also from the archives of Security Service of Ukraine, which inherited the KGB archives for Ukraine. 
And some of these people are rehabilitated, some still considered Nazi criminals and collaborators. So this is basically why my talk, which was originally called uh, Between the Repression and War, is now called Prosecution at War, because these people are not really, not all of them seem to be, repre uh, really seem to be, not all of them can be called repressed, because some of them were actually convicted for crimes they did commit, apparently. So what are the typical criminal case contents from which the data was uh, retrieved? Well, there are questionnaires, so it's like questions from uh, suspects' personal data. So uh, it's case materials like interrogation protocols, face-to-faces, uh, material evidence, this list, even photographs sometimes. I will show you on the next slide. And then there are like uh, indictments of the court and the sentence of the court and the subsequent documentation. So sometimes it's like complaints, requests for rehabilitation, sometimes rehabilitations, which were taking place all the way until the recent days, until the 90s. Uh, so yeah, this is the just an example of uh, a questionnaire from uh, wh where they, the suspect is talking about himself, him or herself. So basically the occupation, year of birth, nation nationality, ethnical nationality, uh, party membership, that kind of stuff. Uh, and these are photos from the, so that they even had, they even took photos of the interrogation procedure. So the person is now showing, uh, the place where they, for instance, the Jews were executed by this, uh, by the collaborators. Uh, so that kind of stuff. And, um, uh, at some point, my colleagues, Seth and Irina, they compiled this, uh, this table. Uh, so basically they put uh, the, data from 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 this from these criminal cases they put it into an, an excel spread spreadsheet and uh this excel spreadsheet was used to in the same record language procedure with the bigger world war ii databases so uh, the first thing we tried is to collate to to link this small collaborators database between and the world war ii losses databases and what we retrieved is 63 unique intersections, so it's name parts in the year again, without geography. And some of these people you already know, actually, because we've met them before in the beginning of my talk, and now I'm going to reveal the mysteries which I placed in the beginning of my talk. Uh, so you remember Iosif Lebich, probably, you remember Filimon Gavriluk, probably, and you also saw at some point, although I didn't stress it out, uh, Hariton Roy. Uh, so these three people are the people whose fates I'm going to describe in a more detail now. So let us get back to Iosif Lebedev. We know that he is listed as dead in 1944, as you remember. Uh, so supposedly uh, he he died uh, and was buried in Czechoslovakia in his grave, number five. Uh, but we also know that he was uh, awarded in 1986. So what happened in between? Well, actually, the collaborators database and the data from criminal case tells us the answer. So apparently, Josef Lebed uh, did not die, but actually, he was mm, uh, he, he had a very complex biography. So um, actually, he first when the when uh, the Western Ukraine was occupied by the German army in 1941. He was recruited into the local police. I think it was like something like Hilsvillige, so in July 1941, and he worked there for three weeks only. Uh, and then he stayed in this Western Ukraine as a peasant, so he stayed under the occupation. occupation. And then uh, in 1944, after the Ukraine was uh, recaptured by the Soviet army, he was mobilized into the Red Army. So this is this is quite a typical thing to happen. Actually, the mobilization in the recaptured territories was as big in scale as it was in the, in the first years of the war. Uh, we can see it from data. So he was mobilized, um, and we know that from again from the uh, from some data from this database. So we know by which conscription office he was mobilized, uh, even. And um, but what happened after that is he actually. So he, so according to, to his testimony, he fought in a pan panel company, company again, and then uh, he was wounded, and then he was sent to Kiev to, to Kiev for treatment, and then he returned to the front, and then after that, uh, he was actually captured by the Germans near Lake Balaton in in Hungary, and then he was sent to a prisoners of war camp in Austria in March 1945. 
So the guy first served for the German uh, helps, uh, he, he was really a police in 1941. Then he was, uh, sub, um, con conscripted to the Soviet army in 1944. And then he was captured by the Germans in 1945. Uh, and then he was liberated by the Red Army in uh, 1945 in Austria because the, the camp was, um, captured by the Soviet soldiers. And then he returned home, uh, went to the filtering, filtration camp. Uh, and he, apparently he, he was able to pass through the filtration camp. And only after that, after the war, he was prosecuted. So, and this, all this we know from the, all this we know from the, um, uh, criminal case records. And the final point in his biography is, of course, that he survived the, his time in, in prison when he was, um, sent to the Soviet prison. Um, and finally, what we know about him is that basically, uh, in, in, in this time of mass, mass glorification of the world, uh, war participants, he was awarded just like everyone else. He was awarded with this order. So as you see, quite a complex biography. Uh, and very similar thing happened to Philemon Gavriluk, uh, because he is actually also from this Ravno Rivne uh, region of West Ukraine. And he um, also was part of, he was actually part of the same, uh, trial against collaborators. So actually he did not, uh, he was not killed, uh, but he was also um, uh, captured by the Germans. But before that, uh, before that, he also served in the German police in this uh, Rivna, Rivna, Rivna Oblast. And, uh, just like, a, it, j so it's, it's, it's very similar case, um, uh, he, he, we are seeing here. Uh, the only difference is that Philemon Gavriluk actually got an honorary mention on a war memorial uh, in the modern day Latvia. I'm not sure if it, the murmur, if the memorial still survives till, till this day, but it's been there. And so he, he, since he was listed as one of the dead when they were constructing this post-war, uh, commemoration memorials in the Soviet era, they put his name on the, on this, uh, piece of granite, granite. So somebody who was convicted by the Soviet, uh, by the Soviet mm, military court after the war for collaboration with the, uh, with the German, uh, army is actually also memorized here as the kind of a war hero somewhere on these plates. So it's actually uh, seems to me quite a, quite a telling detail. And finally, let's look at the, my last, my last, um, uh, hero or not hero, but last subject for today, uh, Hariton Roy. Uh, this guy is a bit different because here we see that he actually deserted already in 1941 from the army. Uh, so it seems that um, so pretty early and from the protocols of his investigation, we know that he worked in the German police also on the occupied Ukrainian territory in Kherson region. Um, and he worked, uh, in, uh, for the German police in October of 1941. And according to the materials of the, uh, of the criminal case, he actually helped to convoy the 160 Jews to the place of their, uh, execution. And he test, he gave a very long, prolonged testimony in uh, how he, how he did it and how the Nazi soldiers actually executed these Jews, uh, how they stripped them of their clothes. And he was, of course, claiming that he was only helping, that he was only like bringing the cartridges with the new, with the new um, bullets, but not actually taking part in the shootings themselves. And, and he also claimed to, to be kind of not very involved. But we don't know was he really how how deep was he involved in the executions of the Jew. He was definitely present at them, but uh, we don't know. So um, and then uh, what's interesting is that we also see the same person awarded uh, in 1945 by the by a military medal uh, for the for the battle merit, uh, which is a not a jubilee award, but actually a real award, which was awarded right at the time of the, of the fight. And you could, we can even find the details of his award. So it says that he, under the fire of the enemy, risking his life, he, uh, actually pushed 25 cows and <laughs> evacuated them into the, into the backyard, into the back of the village. So hid them from the, from the, from the German army. So this is, um, really a document also, an interesting document. So how did it happen? Uh, again, it's the same story. So Hariton Roy served in the German militia or German police, uh, police on the occupied Herson region. And then he stayed there and worked as a peasant, basically as a tractor driver. 
And then, when the Soviet army recaptured the territory, he was conscripted in 1944. You can actually tell it from these documents. So he was conscripted in the Nikolaev region of Ukraine. And then he went to the army, and apparently he fought, he fought well. Uh, I mean, he was actually awarded for the, for the battle merit. And this, this, uh, this uh, case actually gave us the idea to go further and look for the intersection, not with the loss, uh, reports, but with the award, uh, database. And we found 65 intersections, which partly inter, partly overlap with the previous 63, but, uh, mostly don't. They don't. So you can see here, uh, Hariton Roy, but there are also other people, uh, and some of them are actually uh, real intersections. So like, for instance, this Grigory Kozhin, he got his medal in 1944 for Valor, but after that, so this is a really a medal which wasn't given in in vain or which wasn't given for no um, for, for nothing so it's it's one of the most uh, kind of valued soldier medals for the for this war so he was awarded the medal 1944 but then after the war we know that he was again prosecuted for uh, apparently for uh, collaborating with the enemy in the earlier stage of the stages of the war so uh, i think this assortment of people and their uh, fates uh, allows us to make some preliminary conclusions um, uh, that basically there are people who were both recipients of military awards, who are both uh, mentioned on war memorials as the heroes, and at the same time they are convicted collaborationists. And medals which they received could come both before and after the trials and sentences. So some medals are actually wartime medals, which they received and they, they were convicted. Some medals came to them after the trials and sentences when the Soviet, uh, the late Soviet, uh, the late, so the late Soviet Union tried to really glorify, uh, all the living, uh, veterans at the moment. And uh, yeah, and those who collaborated with the occupation forces could actually, after retaking the territories by the Soviet, be mobilized to the Soviet army on a regular basis. And sometimes apparently they fought well, or at least the awards kind of hint at that. So all in all, I think this uh, shows us how adaptive a human being is, basically. And this really defies the assumption that human behavior can be assessed in these binary categories, which are typical for uh, Soviet and even contemporary Russian historiography, where there are like the good guys, the bad guys, the traitors, the heroes, and they're like, you know, the black and white. So we can obviously see here that some people who were unfortunate enough to be taken, uh, to, to, to be in the westmost regions of uh, then Soviet Union, they were encountered by, they, they were quickly uh, occupied by the German army, and so they went to work for the Germans. But then they were retaken by the Soviet army, and so they went to fight for the Soviets. So it really highlights how complex this picture is. And I think this is where the digital methods provide us kind of the, I don't know, the, um, let's say the tools, the, um, the kind of the initial, uh, the ability to see, to, to filter out such, such interesting, double biographies like double biographies of different of, of people and then we can first uh, f first to fi find them among the millions of records using using digital tools and some algorithmic algorithmic uh, heuristics and then we can go back to the in-depth study of this particular of this particular cases which is more useful to a traditional historian so i will conclude with the telling about what we intend to do in the further work well um we mm, oh, we plan to properly normalize the uh geodata in this uh large da larger databases you saw already what are the challenges uh even matching the regions is a challenge matching the names of the villages is even more challenging uh we want to produce a more viable record linkage solution there are of course many uh, many complicated machine learning based uh, sophisticated tools for record linkage and since in our team we have some people who could be called like 
uh, lightweight data scientist and I myself can do a bit of machine learning, not so much, but a bit. So we intend to extend this line of our research so that our tools were somewhere in between the 50,000 and 159 matches. We need something that would be more balanced in between these two numbers and between the very big overlap with lots of false uh, positives and very small overlap with lots of uh, false negatives. And so we want to go deeper into this overlap between the victims of repression databases and the World War II database, which I think still holds a lot of interesting uh, biographies in there. We just need to figure out the optimal way to find them. So uh, many thanks for your attention. And uh, I'm, of course, willing to answer some of your questions.